Hello and welcome to the HOA Show, where we discuss the news, problems, trends, and critical issues relating to life in a homeowner association. Join us every episode, and together we'll explore how to survive and thrive in the dizzying world of HOAs. Hello and welcome to the HOA Show. In this episode, we'll be discussing tendering insurance claims for your community association. We'll discuss when to tender a claim, what the claim process is like, what effect these claims might have going forward, and hopefully we'll address some pitfalls you can avoid to make sure that the process goes smoother. I'm Ryan Gazelle. And I'm Tim Klein, and today we're joined by David Swedelson of the law firm Swedelson & Gottlieb and Tony Menke of the client agency. Since 1987, the Swedelson Gottlieb firm has been devoted entirely to the representation of homeowners associations, condominium projects, and common interest developments throughout California. The firm was started by David and his wife, Sandra. Hey, David, how did you get your name first before Sandra? Just luck. <laughs> I, I think at the time... A moment of weakness on her part? I think at the, at the time I was doing HOA work and she was coming into it, and so my name went first. But, lucky you. And she's still managing partner, and lucky me. <laughs> <laughs> and what made you decide to specialize in law for common interest developments? Interesting question. A quick story is I was a condo owner in those days, in the early 80s. And someone, uh, Tim knows, Mark Goldberg, mm -hmm. was my manager, and the Davis Trilling Act was coming in, and I had a few clients, but I was on my board, and uh, the lawyer for the association came in, and let's just say I wasn't impressed, and, <laughs> and left and said, said I could do that. And the manager said, you should really get into this area. Davis Trilling Act's coming, you know, they're talking about the act. It, I was looking for a niche, and that was the niche. And you found it. And I found it, and then Sandra joined me in 1987. She was changing her direction. And she decided to join me part-time because we had our first child. And uh, I think she worked part-time one day, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like her. Yes. <laughs> and also with us is Tony Menke. Tony has been with the client agency for almost 15 years now, right? Wow. Almost 15, yeah. And wow. Tony is our resident claims specialist. Never a dull moment when it comes to claims, is there, Tony? Not usually, no. There's always something colorful coming across. And Tim, how many claims have you been involved with hey. in the more than 30 <laughs> years you've been doing You know, this? Yeah, I was thinking about that. It's been 39 years. 39 years? Yeah. Wow. Can you imagine that? So one or two claims. What's funny is we're talking about claims, and I, we're, I was telling you before I had uh, some things happen in my house in the mountains, and I have to make some claims. <laughs> I have to call my. Yeah, I, have to call my I have to call my agent. Not the, I have to call my agent after this and see if I can make a claim on my damage or not. Yes, and if they're unsure on what to do, then they can listen to the podcast and then there they'll you know. go. Yeah, I'm sure it'll cover that. Yeah. Uh, so let's start off with when to tender. Uh, it seems pretty obvious that you know when to tender a property claim. You know, if there's no property damage, there's no property claim. But it's a lot less clear when it comes to liability claims. So, David, when do you recommend notifying the carrier about a potential liability claim? Well, we're going to talk about it probably more as we get into this. Absolutely. But I've seen associations denied coverage because they did claim, they didn't tender the claim timely. And so I'd say tender as soon as possible. Uh, don't be worried about the increase in insurance rates. We'll, I'm sure you guys will talk about what th th that means. Um, at least put the carrier on notice that you have a potential claim. Somebody says they're going to sue. Um, don't, I have associations that have lost coverage because they thought that the homeowner was never going to sue and then they do sue years later and then boom, they have no coverage. So now, but there's a difference between a verbal accusation. You know, somebody just says, I'm going to sue you. Do you call your, your broker right away? Or do you want something in written form? I don't think it has to be written. That definitely not written. I think the board, if they're, they need to talk about it, see what's going on. I think the first time someone says that, you can let it go and watch what happens. But if you have a persistent problem with a homeowner, there's some homeowners that are, I can think of two situations now where associations have denied coverage because they had ongoing issues with home, a homeowner who threatened to sue and they said he's never going to sue and then he or she sues. And then the carrier says, hey, you didn't tell us two years ago, three years ago, and cover, there's no coverage. I think it's safe to say, though, that a written demand for damages, it's going to constitute a claim, whether it's a, an email or a, a piece of correspondence or even the minutes of a board meeting. Absolutely. That, that acknowledges that there is an upset homeowner and is making certain ac accusations and threats. I think that is the time where the board is really obligated to put the carrier on notice. It doesn't mean it's going to become a claim, but at least let the carrier know that this accusation has been made. Right. And it can be just an accusation. It doesn't have to be a demand for something. I, I think that the interesting thing is that, in, particularly in California, you can sue for any reason. There doesn't have to be a justification necessarily. Uh, they feel like they've been wrong. They put it in writing. Uh, we have an obligation to respond. 
Yeah. Um, with that in mind, I'm just kind of curious, David, in your experience, what are some things that get in the way of that sort of, you know, sooner tender rather than later tender uh, to the carrier? Things like, you know, are there people who just assume it's not going to become anything and sort of dismiss it until it is a problem? Or in your experience, what are some of the things that get in the way of that? Well, you know, there's there are people in California, people sue the, the drop of a hat. It you know, costs $500 to file a lawsuit and you don't have to prove your case up initially. And people are very prone in California, especially as Tim alluded to, um, to saying, I'm going to sue you. Just, you know, there's so many lawyers and they just do it. And so people tend to think, ah, they're just, they're bluffing. They're not going to sue. It's BS. And there's been some instances where that's true, but but often there's instances where it's not true. And then they, they do sue and then you're stuck. So I think the interesting difference between a liability claim and a property claim is the fact that a property claim is somewhat manageable. We know that you know, a certain amount of property damage occurred, a deductible would apply, and a board can make a reasonable decision whether or not they want to pursue a claim or they want to just handle it themselves. Unfortunately, when they get into that gatekeeper mode where they decide we're going to be the decision makers of whether or not this goes to our insurance company or not, they can kind of run afoul, particularly on a liability claim where just the cost to defend can be hundreds of thousands of dollars, not to mention the resulting indemnification. Right. So I think that's the mentality that I find is frustrating is that we, he's always been a pain in the butt and we don't want to submit a claim. We're not going to have him cause our insurance rates to go up. I think you were involved in two that I know about, Tim, that uh, there was that one where the lady was complaining about loss of review and she wasn't really part of the association. She was claiming that they had an obligation to provide a review and she kept saying that over a period of years and the board sort of just, eh, you know, she's not even part of our association. And then she sued. For this view, she lost eventually, but there was no coverage because they consider it to be a late tender. Late tender. Yeah. And why is that? Why is that important? You know, Tim, why is it? Why would the carrier deny coverage for tendering late? The carrier believes that if they manage the claim from the get go, that they have a better opportunity to, to mitigate the damages. If they have an opportunity to decide when their checkbook gets used or not, they're not going to have some, somebody manage the claim. And then when it goes afoul, come to them and say, oh, here. We have $100,000 worth of legal fees, and they're suing us for $10 million. When we could have settled well, it for five. Well, to just to add on what you're saying, Tim, they think, the carrier thinks that had they been involved earlier, maybe it would never have turned into a lawsuit. Right, maybe. So that's what they think. There's a second one that I'm dealing with now, what Tim knows a bit about, where the homeowner's forever been claiming, you don't touch my balcony, it's mine, and he's wrong, it's common area, and he doesn't want this, they're doing a redo project at the association, he doesn't want what they're doing. And he's been saying for several years, and, uh, and he claims that they're doing everything they do, he claims they're doing it wrong. And he's been doing it for years. And finally, it, when they went to try to collect a special assessment, he sued to try to block the collection of the assessment. And that's what prompted it. But they should have told the carrier maybe two, three, four years ago, this is a bad guy. He always is barraging the board with negative stuff. He's just a negative guy. So... That's, you asked the question about what happens, you have a negative guy, and then you don't think he's going to do anything, he's just all bluff, and then he comes out and sues. Yeah, it always seems to me, from my vantage point, that it's, you should view it as a form of damage control. Because, you know, on the one hand, people are afraid of, you know, having a claim affect their insurance rates and those sorts of things. But on the other hand, if you wait, as Tim had said, when the claim, you know, blossoms into this entire other situation... Then you're looking at defense costs and possible rejection in which your defense costs then come out of pocket. Um, it just seems like it's always better to be proactive and sort of try to get out in front of these situations. We all know about that, but I was thinking as you were just speaking that I think a lot of boards don't understand the timing. They don't know. They think, oh, we have to wait for a lawsuit. No, you don't have to wait for a lawsuit. Or they think when the claim really become manifests itself as a true claim, then I can bring it. And that might be too late. I don't think they realize the rules that require that, and this is mostly directors and officers liability policy, right, Tim? Well, it could be a GL claim as well. I mean, the GL claims are also kind of sometimes get buried because of the concern about trying to protect the master policy, and we don't want to see that kind of litigation show up on our loss history. But you're right, DNO claims as well. There are two areas where I think the board has to be very conservative in terms of their approach and, and go ahead and submit it to their agent or broker and have it tendered to the carrier and let the chips fall where they may. Hopefully nothing will come of it. And that claim will be closed without pay, and it'll just be something of a small anomaly we'll have to overlook and help the carrier to overlook at the time of renewal. But aren't most DNO policies more specific on 
the occurrence and the timing of the claim than the than than general liability policy? Yeah, and I think the interesting thing about DNO claims, which we don't find as often in general liability claims, is the board can get sued for their actions and they can get sued for their failure to act. And the nature or of those... Or a perception of the failure to act. Right. Well, and it's just the perception that somehow they're just challenging the way we were operating the association. That's not really a claim. Well, it could be a claim. And depending on the nature of, you know, the, of the things that are being discussed, it could be a very large claim. I, I'm, as we're speaking and you're talking right now, I'm thinking about a situation I have now where the association is, I don't think you're, you provide insurance for them. I have been their attorney off and on for many years. Didn't realize they had such significant problems. The structural engineer says they have one of the worst cases of dry rot and damage that he's ever seen. Some guy buys this unit from a woman that's going to lose it in foreclosure. Doesn't even go through a traditional escrow. He's only owned it a few months. He's a flipper, right? So he fixes the unit up. He wants to sell. And he says, okay, when are you going to fix my balcony? When every single balcony probably needs to be rebuilt in this 80-unit complex, right? And he says, I'm going to sue. I'm thinking to myself as we're talking, geez, I got to talk to this board because uh, maybe they need to put the care on notice because they, they're not going to be able to fix this guy's balcony <laughs> in, in the short term. And I think there's a misconception about putting a carrier on notice. I mean, as soon as we put them on notice, so to speak, they then have the option. It, you, you can't withdraw that claim at that point, right? Yeah, that's correct. Because in a liability claim, whether it's DNO or general liability, the carrier reserves the right to investigate any occurrence to determine for itself what constitutes a claim. So while you may just, you know, as the insured want to just sort of let them know, hey, we have a situation that may become a claim, the carrier could look at that, or their adjuster could look at that and go, no, I think we should actually be more proactive and assign counsel to defend and address the situation now. And it's not because they want to uh, rack up a, a lot of bills. They're, they're trying to protect the insured as well as themselves yeah, from goes, greater liability. Exactly. It goes back to what we were talking about, what the carrier's perception of managing the claim from the earliest point as possible. But, you know, the carrier might not uh, jump in with a lawyer. I'm seeing carriers be very proactive these days and sending out a claims representative to look and see, can they resolve this claim now? I, I'm thinking of a situation I'm now with a townhouse plan development where the management says, well, we don't fix those things because they own their own home. But it was the roof that you maintained that leaked and there's damage. And so the unit, and now they got a notice on the outside that the city has said this unit is yellow tagged. <laughs> and so uh, I said, you better tender this to the carrier. And sure enough, the carrier is sending people out to talk to the lawyer, not defense lawyer. They're sending out claims representatives to look and see if they can evaluate and adjust the claim and get it resolved sooner than later before lawyers get involved. So that's another motivation. And a lot of times I, I know we see a uh, crossover, you know, so if we get a, a notice of a liability, we're, we're likely to tender it to both the general liability carrier and the DNO carrier, depending on how the, the suit is worded or the demand is worded, it could trigger coverage under both. I recommend without doubt tender it to both because you never know. Let, Let them figure it out. If one carrier denies it, they're not going to not, uh, you tell me, they're not going to ding the association for having submitted a claim that they don't cover, right? No, I mean, the claim shows up on a loss history, but it's, you know, it's an entry in the record. It's not like there's a claim with the significant payout that's going to, you know, affect the loss ratio. And it's, again, still in the form of damage control, it's much better to have a claim for $0 listed on there as opposed to, you know, a claim that you waited and then became, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in defense. Right, right. Well, you know, Tim's got an article on your, um, your article, but Tim's quoted in the article as saying tender and tender often. The carriers are going to look for two things. They're going to look at loss frequency and loss severity. So if you've got even just one humongous loss, you're likely to be non-renewed by that carrier, if it's a preferred admitted carrier, or maybe they'll tag in, uh, you know, a much higher uh, retention deductible, you know, or, or they'll exclude certain types of claims. And what's interesting about our industry is how complex some of these claims are. Because getting back to this balcony claim, there's a couple of interesting issues, I think, surrounding balconies, particularly now, and we're listening to outside of California, uh, the state of California has a new law that took effect that has some really um, impactful uh, legislation around what board's obligation is in terms of inspecting balconies. The one that goes to effect January, the uh, yeah. uh, don't the get balcony started. bill. Yeah, I'm I'm pleased to see it because there's lots of balconies that are in problems out there. So. Well, and I think what's interesting is is that that in and of itself is a property damage loss. 
And while we would submit it to the director's and officer's liability policy, there's an outright property damage exclusion. So in all likelihood, that's going to be a GL claim at the end of the day. But where is there damage until the balcony fails? So you think it's a GL claim. What is the claim? Well, I'm assuming the GL claim is physical damage, I guess, to the quality of the deck. I don't know. You, well, you, you can't have it, let them continue to use the deck. Okay, so a first-party claim. We know the first-party claim is going to be denied. They're not going to – because it, more likely than not, the reason the deck has got problems is because there was a failure to maintain. Well, or a, a latent building defect or poor materials or workmanship. And all the above are – Yeah, are excluded. So they're not going to have first-party coverage. And, and I think the third-party claim uh, from a D&O standpoint would be the breach of contract or, or failure to enforce – or to face the obligations of the board to fix, repair, and maintain the deck. But now that it hasn't been maintained and has to be replaced, is the DNO carrier on the hook for that? Well, I see two DNO and the GL carrier on the hook for this because I can see just like the bed bug case, I see somebody potentially suing saying, hey, this is diminishing the value of my unit. That's a damage claim. And then they're going to say, and also I, I want to, I'm going to sue the association to fix it because you're not fixing it. Yeah, that becomes gonna, a, ah. Fair to act. So it becomes a DNO claim because the board's not doing anything. But the challenge will be these, uh, these DNO carriers that are trying to enforce this property damage exclusion and whether or not they'll be successful in saying, but that this claim resulted as a result of property damage, although it was negligence. Well, these, these are unique claims, like you were saying. And then I told you I got two declination letters. It's complicated. The carrier's looking at it and says, oh, this is, this is really a, a DNO claim because the CGL carrier is looking at it and saying, DNO claim because they're really asking the, what the board to fix it. And the DNO carrier looks at it and says, no, they're, they're really the same that their value of their units diminished because they don't have a balcony they can walk on. So The CGL being the commercial general liability policy in case exactly. somebody listening didn't know. So the, the advice that you're giving, David, is to submit under the general liability to DNO and potentially the umbrella policy, depending on the nature of the claim. Well, you tell me, would the umbrella policy have coverage that the CGL or the DNO policy wouldn't have? Not necessarily. Right. I mean, there are some circumstances where a commercial general liability policy would be modestly broader than the underlying, but it's really designed to be a, a form following, meaning that if it's being provided bodily injury and property damage coverage on the underlying general liability policy, then the umbrella will cover the same, and similarly on the DNO form. Essentially adopting the same exclusions and coverage that the underlying policy has. and and. Uh, who can tender a claim? Ah, good question. You're asking that because on the under the general liability policy, the homeowners are additional insureds, right? So technically you think they could make a claim, but tell some boards that who tell the agent, don't let them make a claim. And so strangely enough, and unfortunately, we don't have any case law in California, nor do we have any statutory language on this. I think homeowners can make a claim under the policy. We're under in some unusual circumstances. And Tony, maybe you could talk a little bit about the Unfair Claims Settlement Act. And Yeah. So in California, the California Fair Claims Settlement Practices uh, requires that any licensed agent or broker, once they receive notice of an occurrence, is required to notify the carrier. So if, you know, an owner were to approach us or a board member, whoever it may be, if there's a situation that could be considered a claim, we're required to notify the insurance carrier, regardless of where the source is. So for those associations who have the board who might want to feel a little bit more like a gatekeeper and sort of regulate what gets submitted and what doesn't. Uh, it becomes, Wait, when does that happen? It's an occasional <laughs> thing. Um, but it becomes problematic for us because, you know, the state dictates our obligation as opposed to, you know, while we have an obligation to our insured, obviously, you know, it sort of is overruled by, you know, the state. So you have a homeowner that, that calls your office because they know you provide coverage for the association. They tell you that I've got this claim. The board's not fixing this problem. It's leaking. It leaked in the last rinse and rain. And then the board says, no, we don't want you to make this claim, but you feel duty bound under law because you now know there's an occurrence. Depending on the circumstances, I mean, oftentimes what will happen is if a, if a serious situation or an emergency situation comes in, you know, called in by a homeowner and we submit it and then the board calls in after it's already been submitted, it's almost like, you know, Cat's already out of the bag. There's, we can't put it back. So then it's just sort of asking for forgiveness as opposed to permission. But um, it is really tricky. And a lot, of, a lot of boards are concerned about that because they want to maintain the loss history. They want to sort of be in control of that. But, you know, there's the question of what is the obligation to the owner? What are the owner's rights as the person who pays for that 
insurance out of their dues. This is a big debate with a lot of associations. They it's a it's a tough issue. Yeah. I mean, as is a licensee, and all, all fourteen people on our staff are licensed in the state of California to, to conduct insurance. If they knowingly do it, it's a ten thousand dollar penalty. If they unknowingly, or, you know, mistakenly forget to submit a claim, it's a five thousand dollar penalty. So it's not the ramifications financially for us if we don't go ahead and pursue the claim. And especially for property claims, we try to make our insureds aware of the fact that, like Tim said, property claim is finite. A liability claim, if you don't submit that to the carrier, you're going to get sued as a liability claim, and that can be astronomical. There's no limit on that. You know, right. And most of these regulations came out of the Oakland firestorm in 91. You know, these are, So these are really uh, circumstances where carriers were not making good on their obligation to pay claims. And the insurance commissioner really came down firmly on them and said, yes, you will be responsive to these claims and we'll change the insurance code to make sure that it happens. Really? There are uh, other insurance agencies that uh, don't do this. I know this because I see the interaction, I see emails. Sometimes I'm just left on the emails and I see that the agent gets a notice of a claim from a homeowner and the board is very strong. The manager's telling the insurance agent, no, do not make the claim. The board does not want the claim made. And they'll acquiesce. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, it is their policy. So if they feel strongly and they're willing to document the request, you know, there may be a case for, hey, they told us not to. This is our client and we're following their instructions. I don't know that... I mean, I certainly wouldn't recommend that. And given the opportunity to, you know, proceed with the claim and then receive that instruction after it already been submitted is preferable to me, um, just for the protection of the integrity of, you know, the way we do business and things that we want to have out there. But it would be, you know, a rock and a hard place between doing, you know, fulfilling your obligation and having that strict admonition from your client. You know, it seems silly to me that you, you, you've got someone making an allegation or a complaint or has sustained damage. Why not let an independent third party? I mean, insurance companies are not philanthropic organizations. They're not just giving money away. They're paying money because they feel that a dollar is due somebody. Why not give that opportunity to the insurance carrier? And if there's no money due them, they'll be close without payment. I think that we need to educate our prospective clients more about the fact that they're not going to get deemed just because the claim is made. And, and tell me something. I've heard in the past that the carriers will look at like a nuisance claim. And not necessarily ding the association because somebody makes a, a crazy uh, uh, claim. We particularly like nuisance claims when the when the perpetrator or the, the person causing the nuisance has left the project. That makes us very happy. Insurance companies respond well to that information. But if they're still there and they're making a what's a, really a nuisance claim, it's not a really a, a solid valid like claim. Like I mentioned before, they're looking for loss severity and frequency. So if they see ten claims by the same claimant that were all closed without pay, they still might non-renew because they say they might ask, is this person still living there? And if they are, chances are there's going to be another claim filed by that person. And maybe the first 10 didn't take, but maybe he finally has something to sue about. And he's obviously suit happy. Other tools they're using these days, you probably know this better than I do, is that the care, some carriers are saying, we'll give you coverage but we will exclude any claims by that uh, homeowner. Right. Yep. Um, or, and I see lots of, a uh, lot more claim uh, policies with retentions, where normally I hadn't seen that before. Well, but... usually the retention for most DNO you know, policies, as an example, the retention doesn't apply to the defense. So, you know, if you've got a $5,000 retention on the DNO you know, policy, you're not going to see that because the carrier is paying the first dollar to defend that claim. But you'll mm. see it on the back end in the indemnification process. I've seen, I have seen some, on both. I've seen both. I have one, I have one uh, large association that has a um, $50,000 retention and the, we're in a, involved in a lawsuit now, it's covered, and the association had to pay the first $50,000. Well, if it's a $50,000, then that means they've had claims before, because that's the only way you're going to get to a $50,000 retention. Uh, and in that case, they will usually uh, apply that to the defense costs as well. But if you haven't had any claims and you're clean, or you had maybe one small claim, then usually it doesn't apply to the defense cost, just the indemnity. David's got some tough cases in his He does. In his practice. But I like you know. said, you know, if you are uh, an association with a lot of claims, then they are going to apply uh, a larger retention to your association. Ah, another thing that a lot of lawyers are, are 
afraid of. I was saying before, they're afraid of declination letters. They don't know how to deal with them, and they don't understand what to do with a reservation of rights letter. You know, I, I've been practicing long enough um, to remember the days before we had, we had when Kumis first came, oh, I should probably say what Kumis is. So in California, when you get a reservation of rights letters, one of the first things that we lawyers look at is to see, does it create a conflict between the insurance carrier and the association that would give rise to the ability of the association to retain its own counsel to defend it. In the early days of Kumis, which is the name of a insured uh, who sued his insurance company out of San Diego, so we always say Kumis. I think even nationally they say Kumis, uh, just right to independent counsel. Subsequently, they made new law go beyond what the case did, and it's much harder now to uh, get appointed Kumis counsel because you have to show that the actual conflict, the actual d disagreement would allow the attorney, the defense attorney, to direct the, the, the case in a, an adverse way to the association, for example. So reading a, a reservation rights letter, you look at two things. One is you look to see, is there the ability for the association to retain their own counsel? Because a lot of boards would rather have their counsel than the insurance company's counsel. And the second thing you want to see is oftentimes they'll have such reservations that they'll reserve the right to go back to the association for fees and costs. We call it, it's a, called the bus case is, the, is where we get that from. And the bus case was Jerry Bus, who used to own the Lakers, right? And he had an insurance case where they went back to him to claw back some of the money they'd spent on the defense because they, uh, under the reservation rights, they, the facts turned out to be that yeah, there right. wasn't covered. So that's uh, we get that a lot in letters now, ROR letters. R ROR letter means reservation of rights letter. And so we get those in and it'll say the carrier reserves the right to come back to the insured to recover some of the fees and costs they've expended in this case. That's scary. It's a scary prospect, particularly if you're concerned about the insurance carrier's ability to provide you with decent counsel. Right. I mean, it, it happens less now, but 20, 30 years ago, Insurance carriers were assigning counsel that knew nothing about HOAs, yep. knew nothing about the civil code, you know, didn't take the time to read the CCNRs, just buzzed in and expected to get educated on the insurance carrier's dime, and then and then you kind of was hobbled in terms of providing defense for the HOA. There are some very good insurance defense counsel, but by and large, these guys that do insurance defense work, they're not doing strictly HOA condominium law work. They're doing slip and falls and accidents and whatever, and they get assigned a case that, you know, like a damaged case, and they don't understand the nuances that we understand as we've been involved in this industry for so many years. I think a lot of associations don't realize that uh, counsel will be assigned to them. They think they can just bring their own counsel along and have them defend. What would be the role of the association's counsel in a claim process if they're already assigned counsel by the carrier? That's a, that's a very good question. And we often recommend that the association allow their own counsel to monitor the case, monitor the handling of the claim in the case when, as it's going along, because there are times when the carrier itself will want the association to do things that, that I, as the association's counsel, would say, no, wait a second, that, that you shouldn't be making my, my client do that. So it's important, depending, you know, a small damage claim, maybe not, but something that's more complex, they should generally have their, their own counsel monitoring it and watching what's going on and be able to counsel the board on whether they should make, when they're asked to contribute or to make certain decisions. There are some cases, claims, that the insurer can't settle without the association uh, cooperating because something requires the association to do something, fix this or change that. And oftentimes the carrier will push. Uh, I'm, I got a case right now where the carrier is saying to me, well, we could definitely settle this if the association dropped its claim to attorney's fees because the association sued the homeowner cross complaint. And I'm going, wait a second, we're not going to give up our right to attorney's fees because you make it easier for the carrier to settle the case. We talked a little bit earlier about decks and deck services, roofs, plumbing. These are all components that are typically not in a 30-year reserve study. What, what do you see is the largest unmanned train coming down the pike for most HOAs out there in terms of these type of failure to maintain and... Repair and replace. I, I could tell you one that I'm seeing is going to happen, a new one that I'm, um, that I'm now sensing. Well, one is that associations don't reserve for termite uh, fumigation, and they should. And, and that's the one thing. But the new thing that I'm seeing a lot of are fireplace cases. I'm not sure if you guys have gotten any of these where they're now finding more and more they're finding fireplaces that were either defective 
initially. Some buyer does a scope and then they find something and then you're, you're hard I, I have to tell the board, you need to check out more because if you got one, you might have others. And, you know, just because you're going to fix one doesn't mean that others might not need fixing. And what I'm seeing now also is that a lot of fire of older buildings are having fireplaces that are rusted or just aged. And I've been talking to fireplace experts recently because I got several of these and they're telling me that it's a mistake for an association to believe that their fireplace is a permanent component, that it's not going to need replacing. And the associations are shocked when they have to spend eight, ten thousand dollars per fireplace. Put in a new firebox. Right. Exactly, because it's rusted out. And so this is coming down the pike. I see this becoming uh, something that f- associations aren't truly savvy to. And the fireplace, one fireplace expert that I'm working with now, he says he wants to get it out to our industry that we should be looking at fireplaces. I mean, it's interesting because you know I've been around long enough that these projects were new when we got started. Yes. And so deferred maintenance wasn't even in the equation. And now it seems to dominate the types of losses that we're seeing almost always are water-related claims that are huge numbers. Another component that's not reserved to her, the pipes. Well, I'm sure you guys may see it as much as I do, but are you seeing associations that have become obsolete, that they, they really should be torn down and rebuilt? And I'm seeing that more and more. There's a lawyer up north, uh, I don't know if you know the Birding Wow firm. Tyler Birding has been a strong proponent of saying that there are some associations that should be ended, torn down. How do you, how do you go about doing that? Well, interesting you say that. In California, it would be very difficult, but I have a friend who practices HOA law in, in Texas, and he says in Texas they pass a law that says they don't need 100% of the owners to agree to a buyout by a developer, and so they need 80%. And so if 80% of the homeowners vote to sell, and what the benefit here is that these developers are paying uh, top dollar, more than market value for the units, because what they're doing is we see a lot of associations where there are only two stories. They could be three, four, five, bigger, take up more space and put more homes in the same, same footprint that they didn't put in 40 years ago. So these are underutilized parcels that they're picking on. Well, you and I... If I'm a developer, it's underutilized. The homeowners don't think that, but I'm thinking one association right I'm working with now, they are got buildings that are two or three stories, and they have a lot of lakes and things like that, and they're going through a potential $5 million special assessment, deferred maintenance, classic story of... Keep the homeowners dues low. Keep, keep them low, even reduce them to fit the pocketbooks of the homeowners that live there who can't afford to pay what they really should be paying, and now they're suffering because they didn't make repairs, blah, blah, blah. And so that's perfect association. A developer would come in there, would build bigger, more units, right? But today in California, you need 100% of the owners to vote to do that. So it's not going to happen. I don't think that's going to change in California, do you? I mean, that just seems... Well, here we are talking about it, but this isn't a discussion that people are having. And I think... No, I think it's it's an excellent discussion. I think it's a longhorn anomaly. Don't you think they're just doing business differently down there? Well, I think that what they're doing, I think that law should be here. I think we should have that law. Because I think that there are some, this association I told you about that uh, is up in, uh, it's in Los Angeles, and it's, the structural engineer told me it's the worst project he's ever seen in terms of the amount of dry rot they've got. And I'm afraid when they start opening up the buildings, they know the decks now are all dry rotted, but they had one unit that had water intrusion, they started taking it apart, and they found that half of her subfloor was dry rotted out. I asked the engineer, is that an anomaly? Or are we going to find that elsewhere? He goes, I'm afraid we're going to find it elsewhere. You know, my concern is that, you know, they, Zillow, the real estate website, says that almost 33% of all the housing in the United States is owned outright. That is to say there's no lender. And, and so you have a lot of people who maybe own their home outright and are on fixed income. Where are those people going to go? You know, I got... Not in California. <laughs> I got, I got in, uh, sort of spiked recently at a homeowner forum where I was talking to the homeowners about their association. And I basically said what everyone knew, and that was, you know, if you can't afford the assessments, then you've got to think about whether you can afford to live in this association. Should the association not fix things and levy the assessment to pay for it because the homeowners can't afford it? That's, what, that's why they got into that position in the first place. So the answer is maybe they need to go into a reverse mortgage or something, but the association needs to be able, I think the law, here's another claim. You didn't properly assess the homeowners for what it really costs to maintain and repair the complex. That's the law says you were supposed to do that. Barred on someone else's future, basically, right? And now someone is paying the price. And 
It's unfortunate. I mean, I, it's a really interesting Well, I, I'm it looking is. at, I was talking to these homeowners, and there's one homeowner who later on said that he just bought there and no one told him about all the problems. So here he is going to be in a $30,000 special assessment. That's a disclosure. Well, that's not, that's, that, that's not, that's another Another program. story. This is a great topic, but let's jump back on to uh, claims. The, the claims. Tony, will you take us real quick through the claims process? Like, sure. We get a phone call. What happens? So when we get a phone call from the insured, the first phone call or submission we make is to the carrier to notify them of, you know, this new loss. The carrier is then going to appoint an insurance adjuster to, in the case of a property claim, go uh, hire someone to inspect the property and assess the damage and then prepare a report for the carrier's review. In the case of property, that report is going to include a review of the policy itself, their governing documents possibly, and just what exactly is damaged to see what obligation the association has. Uh, in the case of a liability claim, whether it be DNO or commercial liability, it will go to an adjuster who may or may not, as you said earlier, you know, go to the scene to sort of see if something could be done before defense counsel needs to be appointed. Um, or in many cases, they're going to appoint an attorney to handle negotiations and a potential settlement. Once that attorney is appointed or somewhere along the way, uh, as we mentioned earlier, there'll be a reservation of rights letter where the carrier says, essentially, as of now, based on the information we have, we are agreeing to cover this claim. We reserve the right should this or that happen, and they may cite specific portions of the policy relating to exclusions or conditions. You know, we reserve the right to change our stance later on, and then the claim is handled from there depending on the circumstances. So yes, we'll go out with you, but if you act a little funky on the date, we can leave at any time or make you pay. Well, but this gives another thing about claims, and that is that our clients, respective clients, should be um, encouraged to provide all the information they have, all the documentation they have now, because there's a tendency to hold back stuff, um, thinking Hoping oh, it doesn't get discovered. Exactly. And it's going to. I mean, insurance companies are pretty, they're, they're going to go out and find things, and they're going to find this thing that you're trying to hide, maybe, and then that might impact coverage later on. You don't want to wait till later on. You want to deal with it now. So it, when you get a claim, you should in, we should encourage our respective clients to provide all the information they have. Absolutely. It's also an interesting point. Um, we touched on this earlier, but I wanted to come back to it briefly. Just in the situation where you have a property claim or and there's a lot of misconception about, oh, well, it happened in his unit. It's his responsibility. We don't want the association to pay for that. And they will, you know, either not tell their agent or, you know, in the case you mentioned earlier, prohibit their agent from proceeding with the claim. What happens then is, you know, one of a couple of unpleasant scenarios where if that owner's insurance policy, their individual policy, assuming they have one, will only cover those elements of the loss that are crystal clear from their coverage perspective and stop, then that owner is just sort of left waiting for, you know, indemnity from the HOA's master policy that won't come because the claim's not been tendered. Now you have a situation where this owner is continuing to incur additional expenses and repairs and possibly relocation costs because he can't live in his unit. That's when that property claim could manifest into a liability claim because he's seeking reimbursement for those added expenses. And in fairness to that owner, he's been paying his HOA dues, which go to pay for the that master policy. Exactly. And in, in, in more than that, Fannie Mae and Ginnie Mae and Freddie Mac required that the master policy be primary and that the his individual policy be secondary. So I could see a, an adjuster representing an, an HO6 carrier waiting in the wings for that master policy to pay before they make a coverage decision. And that's why I um, try to recommend to our clients that they increase the amount of their deductible. If they don't want the the, the association's policy be on the hook for these claims, increase the deductible, uh, eliminate the, um, I'm old school, betterments and improvements. It's not a term that's used as much anymore. Wall, walls in and bare wall policies are the term, but get rid of the coverage for betterments and improvements because you're not required to, to cover those. I agree with you partially. I think I, I agree that higher deductible is a way to manage the claim. I think it's the most intelligent way to make sure the board's not the gatekeeper. I disagree though, in terms of the scope of coverage. I think the broader we can get the master policy, the better. I mean, we've been doing this for almost 40 years, and there are still 25% of the individual unit owners in HOAs have no individual coverage at all. And, and if that unrepaired unit gets sold in that unrepaired condition, um, it's going to take down the comps of every other unit in the project. I, I, I agree with you. So, and I, yeah. so I say, let's get, let's get the master policy broader, but let's manage it with a higher deductible so that we're not seeing these small water damage losses being submitted. And, and and the HOA is still essentially the gatekeeper, you know, because you'd still need that declination from the master policy before the HO6 carrier will respond. 
David, there's a question I've always wanted to ask you, and that is how much liability coverage is enough? <laughs> Boy, that is, you know, that is a, uh, I, I, I like that question. And I, I have several examples that I give to people. So for example, there's a case that I know about out there that this guy was at a hotel. He got inebriated. He fell off the balcony because the railing wasn't high enough. It was defective, wasn't the right height. And so he sues for this tragic uh, damages that he suffered, uh, injuries that he suffered from this fall. And the insurance company for the hotel said, um, and it could be, could have been a condominium association just as easily, right? That's why it's relevant. And so the, the carrier said, you were drunk. So they didn't settle. They defended this case, went to trial. And what they basically, the trial determined was, guess what? It's legal to be intoxicated in your own home. And his, the hotel room was his own home for that purposes. So it, you can't say that it happened because he was drunk because he's entitled to be drunk. He's entitled to be drunk with you having the right size railing $25 million later. Wow. And there's this case I just sent him uh, recently where this little girl was hit by a tree at this condominium association and she's, she's okay. She'll go to college, but she suffered traumatic injuries initially, $500,000 of medical expenses. And there was a $14 million settlement out of that case. And that they settled for $14 million because they were potentially looking at more than that if it went to trial. Get and that's a jury. just a, a tree limb. That was a tree. Right. Whole eucalyptus tree fell on It's not on like her. they had a pool, which is an attractive nuisance or a right. playground or something, right. just a tree limb. So, you know, I'm dealing with this now, and I was talk, actually talking to Tim about this, where my own association, we have a guy that wants us to put an AED in. And I'm strongly against the association putting an AED in because, not that it isn't needed, although we have a That's needed a defibrillator, one. defibrillator. Right. Defibrillator. And this guy's brother almost died, and he was saved at some association in San Diego. That association... And their newspaper article said they had used the defibrillator four times in the last eight years. My association's never needed one in the 25 years I've been there. You guys have better hearts over there. I guess so. Yeah. So the point is that they're asking me how much insurance we should have. And I'm thinking with these cases I told you about, $25 million for somebody that, if you've got some executive that's, uh, you know, business guy, makes a lot of money, and he's at the club, and he dies, and he claims, I would have lived had the defibrillator worked. Oh, and by the way... We had a guy from a major company, the defibrillator company, come out to speak to us. And he said, I just went to this other association that we all know in this room and really well-managed association. And each, all three of the defibrillators did not have the pads in them. Someone had taken the pads from all three defibrillators. So they were rendered useless. And wow. if, they, if they had needed one... They could have killed somebody and then more liability. So if you take on the responsibility of having an AED, a defibrillator, and it doesn't work, the potential liability is somebody dies and they say, I would have lived, but had the defibrillator worked. There's an expectation of... So the answer is, is how much can you afford is the answer. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's uh, it, particularly in California, because you just never know what a jury is going to award. What What's the maximum amount of, of liability coverage with umbrella policies can an association get? Oh, we see $50, $7, $500 million. The, most, uh, the highest one that we have, we have a few associations with $100 million. I I don't recall seeing any higher than that. Because I think... Farmers has a limit what they can write? Well, a lot of carriers have a limit on what they write on the underlying policy, but then, you know, the umbrella is obviously um, oftentimes a you know, completely different carrier that has the capacity it's or sometimes a, a layered risk program. Purchasing group. Yeah. Okay. You know, the thing that's interesting, David, and, and playing devil's advocate with regard to your language, uh, it, with regard to this particular issue, the AED issue, and I've thought some about this, is you could use that same argument for fire sprinklers, the same, same argument for fire extinguishers, use that same argument for elevators going to the first floor when there's a fire. I mean, there are a number of safety, life-saving safety devices out there that we rely on knowingly or unknowingly all the time. Seatbelts and cars. But they're mandated by law. So you're, if you're required to have it by law, then I'm saying, yeah, you got to have that for law. You're not required of an AED, AED at a typical condominium kind of association. And, and the, 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 your, your, your argument is that the fact that it exists creates more liability than what it's worth. Well, it's kind of like security cameras. You know, you're not required to have security cameras. If you do have security cameras installed, then you've set up an expectation of security for um, the owners. So then if that security camera isn't working and something happens, there's more liability, I would think, uh, on the part of the association than yeah. had they not had That's to. why, yeah. talking about security, for example, we are very strong in telling our clients, uh, if I see that they say security, I say, do you really offer security? And do you have, you have a gate monitor? Is that, that's not really security. So you, it's important to tell the owners that you don't provide security because those cameras, 
nine times out of 10, probably nine and a half times out of 10 are not monitored. They're just surveillance cameras and they're not going to stop a crime. They're a deterrent. Deterrent. So the answer is, and, a, and there's a, a, a guy, a CAI, George Nowak. Yeah, George a, Nowak, yeah. He, and he, I was just reading an article in Common Ground and he said that, he says, if the association is not obligated to do something, I say don't do it because why take on that responsibility? Now you've taken on the responsibility once you have it. And just like this, my biggest fear was two things. One, that it would be tampered with or stolen and wouldn't be there when you wanted it. Or that it wouldn't work when it wasn't being maintained properly. These days, the whole thing about the AEDs and learning to use them, they're so easy. They walk you right through it. But here's about? this largest, this guy comes to talk to us and he says, and he just off the cuff, no, not even prompt. He says, I went to this large association. He says he texts the three uh, defibrillators and all three, not one, but all three did not have the pads. That's my fear. And, and so I checked on, well, you can get locking boxes or you can get boxes with alarms on them. So I said to the guy, well, okay, what you open it, the alarm goes off, really loud alarm. I said, oh, great. I said, how do you turn the alarm off? Oh, you close the door. So somebody goes in, opens the door, <laughs> takes the defibrillator, they're 1500 bucks, right? Yeah. Steals the defibrillator. And then when somebody goes to need it, it's not there. Somebody didn't, oh, I didn't check this month. Well, and That's if, you hear, if you hear an alarm go out, uh, going off outside your house, do you go outside? No. No. I, I, I make sure it's, if it's you my car, I do. You listen for your car, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I check to see if it's my car, but the answer is that um, associations, my recommendations don't take on something you're not obligated to take on. For example, safety. I'm, I'm teaching a course for CACM on d disaster preparedness. And my thing is that I see associations, they say, oh, we're going to start this thing and we're going to put some medical supplies and food and blah, blah, blah. And then you talk to them a few years later and does anybody check it? No. And they check it and there's things missing. Somebody stole some stuff out of it. So I say, why are you doing that? Nothing says the association is obligated to do all these things. Uh, and you're doing it, and then somebody's going to say, it wasn't there when I needed it, and I, I relied on it. And moral, sues, sues for... The moral of the story is uh, you can be sued for anything. Why, why make yourself a bigger target? Right? Absolutely. I think, Tim, you've told me on a couple of occasions that California is like the capital of DNO claims. Yep. And we're getting more and more DNO claims. What kind of claims are you, are we, Besides are you seeing? Besides New York City, maybe. <laughs> yeah, New York is right up there. But I think New York and California have probably something similar, and that is the breach of contract issue that's basically promulgated by the virtue of there being governing documents. So they're they're suing for failure to comply with the governing documents. These non-monetary claims, I mean, they're not looking for, you know, financial award, they're looking for something to get fixed. And they're expensive, unfortunately. Or they want to be able to paint their house, their their door green. Right. I mean, architectural review committee decisions are, are another area. And people are, people are willing to spend money to fight, to make the, I'm seeing them, so you're seeing them, and there's, there are actually more and more lawyers now who are specializing in representing homeowners uh, out there. But there's a, a, there's still a handful of carriers, personal lines, primarily personal lines carriers that write condominium master policies that don't cover non-monetary claims, which is just surprising to me. In this environment, they not also... Not DNO claims. DNO claims. They, they, they offer they, CGL, they, but not the... They offer, they offer directors and officers liability coverage, but only monetary losses. Okay. Not non-monetary. And, and these these challenges... You know, failure to properly maintain an election, uh, failure to maintain the CCNRs, failure to maintain the architectural re review committee decisions are all non-monetary decisions. So what you're saying is not all policies are the same. People, uh, absolutely you're, you're, not all you're, policies are the same. Your clients think, my clients and our, our clients think they are. There, there are some DNO policies that don't extend coverage to the property manager. Or well, they don't cover um, disability claims and, uh, I mean, uh, 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 discrimination claims. We gain on those all the time. I had a guy just the other day, he's telling the association that they need to do all these things because he's blind. And, and finally, when it came down to it, what did he want? He wanted stuff sent to him in PDF format. I said, that's no big deal. But he was making all these accusations about the association not complying with him because he's blind. They need to do that. The, his, so his reader, he's Partially, I guess he can read stuff special, whatever. You don't do Braille, but I'm just thinking of all these claims that's a out non there. Non-monetary claim. claim. The the most common non-monetary claim we see, one of them is uh, challenges to the election. You know, the election wasn't run properly, and now with this new Wait till election next year. law, <laughs> we're we're thinking we're going to see a lot more of those. So something we haven't talked about here, and I know it's self-serving, but associations should really be encouraged to get their legal counsel involved when they get these claims because the boards don't know what they're doing. And if there's any hiccups in the claim process, 
then maybe the lawyer could fix those hiccups. And you know what I'm saying? Is that I think the lawyer needs to get involved well before that part of the process. When the contract is being signed with the general contractor who says this is an AI, is it AIA? Oh, yeah. It was just a standard form. Well, no, that, that doesn't help Well, you. worse than that, the board signed a boilerplate, NC, you know, what's the NCR paper, the, you know, the like carbon paper thing, and it's like one page and that's the contract. And they're wondering why the work hasn't been done in three years and what the scope of work is and... Yes, absolutely. Or they, or they get um, a certificate of insurance uh, or a, a copy of the policy form from the contractor stating that they are additionally insured, but only as required by contract. And then the contract makes no mention of requiring that uh, vendor to insure and indemnify. Bigger problem that they don't get, they don't, the associations don't know that their contractor has to have an endorsement to cover work on a multifamily. A, a multifamily. Right. And there, there's some strange anomalies out there. There's one policy out there, apparently, that says that it has to be more than eight units. So they define what a multi is. Because I thought it was some policies, I think, exclude all coverage for condominiums, let's say, for example. Mm -hmm. Multifamily dwellings. Multifamily dwellings, no matter how many units. And then some are different than that. But there, there's more and more contractors who are either not don't understand or taking a risk and don't get the endorsement. The association doesn't know. And then there's a, something happens. I have several of these now sitting on my desk where they've had serious damage claims and no coverage because, and, and then what happens is I think that that's probably excluded under the fair to procure insurance, um, maybe, maybe excluded. Well, there may, may be failure to maintain insurance, but oftentimes it has a property damage, underlying property damage exclusion, which would exclude the resulting damage from the repair. So they may cover a breach of contract, for example, for right. a defense, but not cover the indemnity part. There are some DNO carriers now that are uh, including defense for failure to maintain uh, insurance. You know, it's that, that we didn't talk about it also about the failure to obtain insurance or procure insurance exclusion uh, on policies. So I had one happen not too long ago where the association accidentally let the um, sole employee's medical insurance lapse and he had back issues and needed surgery in the future and he sued and the carrier didn't defend. I had to defend the lawsuit. I settled it, but they had to, def I had to defend the lawsuit because it was a failure to procure insurance. They let the, the policy lapse. It, so you got the, the, all kinds of claims out there. It's a minefield, isn't it? Um, it is so a minefield. Thank you so much, David, for, for coming out. We could go on for hours. We could. So many topics. We'll have you back for another topic. Um, how can our listeners reach you? We have our uh, Law for HOA's website, and we also have our uh, HOA Law blog. And What's it called? Uh, HOA Law blog. All right. That's pretty simple. Or Law for HOA's. So either way, finds us. All right. Big thank you for Tony joining us today as well. Tony, nice to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> As we end our episode, we'd like to remind our listeners that if you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for topics you'd like to learn about, you can email us at feedback at hoashow.org. Join us next time on The HOA Show. To share or subscribe to The HOA Show, visit us at hoashow.org. There, you'll be able to listen to other episodes, find helpful resources relating to HOAs, provide feedback, submit questions, and check out other great stuff. The HOA Show podcast has been made possible by the contributions of Klein Agency insurance brokers, leaders in the community association industry. The views and opinions expressed by the podcast, its presenters and guests, do not constitute legal advice. For more information on how the topics and discussion apply to you, please consult with your own legal counsel.